My name is Alma Maldonado Maldonado. I am a researcher at Simvestat, which is a public research center located in Mexico City. I am here transmitting uh, from Mexico City, and I am really happy of being part of the Critical Internationalization Master Classes. So today's topic is the role of international organizations in the internationalization process. And let me just start by saying that uh, when we discuss international organizations, the most common international organizations that have to do with education, obviously are the World Bank, the OECD, UNESCO, the World Trade Organization, all the by uh, or the regional banks, excuse me, all the regional banks such as Africa Nation and, and, and uh, Latin America, and also the binational agencies, which also uh, have an important role in education and in higher education. So um, these are governmental organizations. Uh, I am mostly going to discuss the role of these because they are very important because the states have to do with what they do uh, and the ways they do things. But also we have another, another big portion of international organizations, the la the, the the really uh, majority of them, which are non-governmental, right? So we have governmental, non-governmental. Normally I, I, I work more on governmental, but foundations have an important uh, activities in, in education and higher education. So, and foundations, most of them are non-governmental, right? So this is the first division. There is a, um, there, there is a lot of literature on how we can classify and, and what are the different typologies of international organizations. I am not going to discuss that the, this with you um, because um, it, it will take a lot of time, but I just want you to have this first difference, very clear governmental, no governmental, in governmental, the states play a role. And then we have all these non uh, governmental organizations. Um, we need to, to, to acknowledge as well that international organizations are very changing. Uh, everything changes with, with them, their purpose, their agenda, their mission. Um, they are not homogenic. They are very uh, different in many ways, inside and outside. Uh, they, they are based on their prestige. This is a, a key aspect to understand them. The way they work has to do a lot with the prestige they can earn and, and the, the ways they preserve this prestige based on, on the work they do. Uh, they have different activities, several activities, and they compete among them, but they also collaborate. Right. So after saying that, I am just going to show you five slides, no more than that, uh, given the time constraints. But let me just start with this. After I mention it, what I wanted to tell you about general aspects of international organizations, let me go through this first uh, image. So I, I want to just discuss very general what has been the role of international organizations worldwide? Obviously, we have different, and in my opinion, there are three main aspects that define what they have been doing since its creation, which was after the World uh, War II, second. Uh, so they, these are post-war institutions. This is also very important to have in mind. So to me, there are three pillars, right? Three columns, three columns where they base what they do. 
So one has to do with all the, their activities at the global scale, regional scale, binational scale, and obviously that eventually impacts at the national scales, right? So this general dimension. The second has to do with the liberal democratic values and free market. I won't say this, we can generalize that all of international organizations are thinking on free market. Uh, that would be unfair for the UN system, which they don't have that as part of their mission. But it applies a lot to think about this I, these values of uh, the liberal democratic societies that they preserve and they have as part of the agenda in general, most of them. And the third one has to do with all this model of knowledge production, the way this knowledge is playing um, a role in today's societies, in economy, uh, some organizations would discuss this as uh, the, you know, uh, talking about knowledge societies, but other organizations we discuss this as knowledge-based economy societies. But the most important is that knowledge now is playing a new role that in the past was not as clear and as, con uh, as, as relevant as is today. So after these three main aspects, there are other which are surrounding and there are part obviously of them, but I would like just to, to point out uh, some of them. One has to do with global, global governance and this is related to the way uh, and, and there is a big debate if we can talk about that now uh, there is not only a national governance, but also uh, not only regional, but also a global governance. It means if there are things that we are all doing together in a way and, and conventions that we are all following, and sometimes these conventions are not because they are mandatory to follow, but we all are doing the same things in some ways. We are all following some similar things, similar patterns in the same way. Um, so it has to do with this, this debate. Another big aspect is international cooperation and collaboration. Obviously, since these organizations, international organizations were born after um, the, the, the destruction of the Second World War II, second, uh, we can see how cooperation and collaboration became more important in, 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 in today's world. And sometimes, I mean, there are being ups and downs for this cooperation and collaboration, but it has been important. And it, it is also important to remember that because most of these first international organizations failed in reconstructing Europe, um, they had to put their, their minds and their vision and their agendas in other places. And these other places, um, are things such as development, which is also here part of this image. So these organizations decided that now development must be part, very important part of their agenda, right? Human rights, of course, is part of this debate in some organizations more important than in other, but I think we, we need to keep in mind that all these new developments um, and all these consequences of uh, these um, visions where human rights must be a priority in, in most societies, um, I think is, is also part of this general arena where we are discussing the ways international organizations have impacted our world. Migration, obviously, is another very important aspect. Lately, even more important for, for things that have been happening in our societies and some, country, some international organizations are very uh, deep involved in, the, in, the, in what is happening with migration and the way it's affecting us. Um, and finally, te technology. Technology as an essential part of, uh, of the changing world we are facing, 
especially now after the pandemic, uh, the way technology is impacting societies and education in particular and higher education, um, it's there, it's part of the agenda. And it has been always incorporated in one way or in another in the big debates of international organizations. So this first slide shows you that how international organizations have affected um, today's, today's societies. But now let's go to the second one, which I will try to present as clearly uh, as possible, right? So at the horizontal level, we have what are these activities of international organizations, what they do, and again, I am generalizing and more important, I am referring to uh, governmental and also to non-governmental, but only found, uh, foundations, right? Such as Ford, uh, Toyota Foundation, Kellogg Foundation, Carnegie Foundation, uh, among many, many other. So we have, I, I try to select six different activities that international organizations have performed. Um, more related to higher education. So one has to do with policy recommendations, as you can see, uh, uh, international organizations have done a lot of work recommending things. Uh, sometimes part of the criticism has been in, in the way these recommendations are, are elaborated, this type of recommendations, if they are these general recipes for all the illness, which is something, it doesn't work in medicine, it probably doesn't work in, in, in policy, but this is part of the debate. Financing, big aspect, no, but not all international organizations provide money to projects or to develop uh, policies or to help countries. So some of them do, and they are relevant and they are influenced for that reason. Research and data collection. This is also a, a very important, crucial activity of these international organizations. Then we have networks and meetings, right? And these organizations work a lot with this idea of the importance of networking and, and um, how much they have impact. Well, uh, that's part of the debate. Uh, regimes of, and soft laws. So, it, in, in higher education and in, in education, international organizations are not producing really regimes. Regimes would be these norms that have to be followed by countries, but they have a consequence if you don't follow these uh, norms that are established and signed for the countries, right? Uh, we have regimes in other areas of uh, foreign affairs, such as atomic um, atomic bombs uh, or atomic production, uh, or we have these regimes for uh, the, for limiting the sea areas or the sea yes spaces of countries, and if a country violates that regime, they will hide or face a consequence. We don't have that in education, and. For, for some authors, this is very unfortunate because this is why countries keep sing, signing or signing things in education, but because there won't be any consequence. But we have soft laws. Let's call it that way. We have, we have all these different developments related to human rights. The countries uh, decided to sign and decided to follow. So uh, anyway, the, the only perhaps kind of regime we have closest to higher education has to do with the World Trade Organization in terms of uh, intellectual property, one thing. And second thing, in terms of when the World Trade Organization decided that they are going to, uh, to regular, regulate uh, educational services as part of what of, of the work they do. So those would be the two only examples. And then we have evaluation. 
uh, international organizations do a lot of evaluation, different types of evaluation from PISA, which is uh, the, you know, you know, PISA, uh, this examination for uh, 15 years old students to evaluate their, their previous education, the basic education, and they attempt to do the same thing with higher education. The OECD tried to do that with AHILO. Uh, it wasn't very successful though. And then we have uh, all these different evaluation of policies, evaluation of programs, evaluation of different types of, 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 um, of um, activities performed in, in higher education. So this is one X, right? A horizontal. Let me explain you the vertical one. So in my opinion, there are uh, five main aspects where higher education has been affected by the work of international organizations, right? And, and in that sense, it has impacted uh, the internationalization of higher education institutions. So the first one has to do with the way we think about higher education, right? By the work they do, by the activities they do, we really have changed that, the, the way we are thinking on higher education. And let me just use different examples, but when we discuss higher education as a commodity, as a, cent a central to human capital, as a development gear, as a return, as a human right, as a social or economic right, all these have been, um, have been influenced by the work of these international organizations, not exclusively, but they have contributed. The second big level where they have impact our field has to do with comparative and international organizations. They have done a lot of work in these areas where either uh, creating theories, methodologies, or by creating uh, and collecting data. This has been very important for people who work on these areas and uh, the, the, the documents and policies, the databases, etc. And the third big aspect is by, um, uh, by by taking mobility as important as an important aspect, right? Mobility is a big component of, of internationalization. We know it's not the only aspect, but I think in that sense, uh, the way these, these organizations by either financing or by promoting a particular program, they have uh, really pushed uh, the mobility of students, academic, academics, staff members, experts, etc. So this is another another big uh, uh, and, and relevant uh, influence by these organizations. Uh, uh, also collaboration and cooperation, right? By doing all these different activities in, in different ways, um, international organizations have uh, promoted a lot of programs, projects, scholarships, alliances, networks um, as part of their, their, their work where, where international organizations are becoming more international, right? And then we have building capacity, of course, as part of this, of, of the way now our, our field and our institutions are more international. Uh, and they have work on institutions, systems, subsystems, evaluation processes, decision making policies, etc. I, I don't think this covers everything, but I think it gives you a good sense of how to navigate in the understanding of how these organizations impact higher education. Now, what what I also would like to really make sure I, I am clear with this is that geopolitics play an important role in all of this. Not all regions are similar, not all countries are similar, not everybody negotiates in the same way, not everybody receives the same support and, and type of help by these organizations. 
And it, it is very strategic sometimes, and it has to do with, with regions. Um, I can think now, for instance, in, in the way Africa, in some ways, is becoming the more international uh, region in the world. This is something my, my, my colleague, uh, we studied together at Boston College, Danta Taferra, will, will be very emphatic about it. But um, Africa is the more internationalized region in higher education in the world because it has to do with surviving, because it has to do with the way they have received all the help to perform and to develop different activities. That doesn't mean they necessarily um, are equal partners, right, in this process of internationalization. That doesn't mean necessarily is the type of internationalization they want or they aspire to have. But this is what has been happening given the situation in Africa and given that Without that help, they won't be able to perform and to continue doing things they do. So let me just finish by, by using also this, this example. This, this is kind of a little bit outside of the scope of, high, of international organizations, but this is a good example that when we discuss international organizations, uh, some authors also include the role of transnationals, right? So this is a scene I, 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 I witnessed in India at the Indian Institute Technology of Technology, Bombay, uh, where um, I was having interviews with a group of students um, and suddenly they said, let's have a coffee or a tea. Uh, right now uh, is, is the time, is the hour. And there is this Japanese transnational who is offering every day, tea or coffee, free tea or coffee, sometimes donuts, to students at this IIT uh, in India uh, to try to convince them or to try to generate this idea that Japan is an option uh, once they graduate, right? I, I, I found this very fascinating. <laughs> it's an interesting strategy this would be another type of international organizations, but please let's not forget what is the role also of transnationals in affecting the, 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 the arena of higher education worldwide um, uh, in the world, right? So I, I just wanted to use this example uh, for that. And finally, let me just conclude by saying that here the, the most important question is if uh, higher education is more global today or not, right? From the beginning, from the very old uh, medieval uh, universities that we all aware about them, uh, if they are more global today, if they are more international today, and to what extent this has to do or not with the role of international organizations? This is the key aspect. My answer to this, to this uh, question is that yes, they are more global, they are more international in my opinion, and yes, there is an impact of international organizations in this. Now, the problem is to what extent? The problem is to say, to, to say uh, what is really this impact? What is really this influence? And this became very problematic because it has to do with the ways we study the influence of international organizations in public policy. And by that, let's say, let me go back to this, by that would mean that we need to go for each of these level, analyzing, to what extent a policy recommendation made, let's say in terms of mobility of students, uh, what was the real impact of these recommendations in different countries, in different regions, how much, um, yes, how much uh, leaders in different parts of the world 
really pay attention and follow the recommendations and to understand the process of policy making and to understand uh, and to analyzing each program finance by one of these major foundations in uh, with an agenda of mobility or with agenda where higher education is a central component of development. So that would be the problem to answer this question. Uh, but, but in my opinion, um, this is a major aspect that to be continue researching and to continue study. And I invite all of you to, to get more immersed in, in these debates of international organizations. It's a fascinating, fascinating, uh, fascinating topic. Uh, and by that, we need to study each institution, each organization, and then to keep looking at particular cases, which could be the only way to really try to get a more profound knowledge of how much really they impact higher education policy. But the general aspect, I, I hope I, I cover, and I hope I uh, leave you with more questions that, than answers. And again, I appreciate a lot the, this invitation to participate in this master class. I appreciate your attention and thank you very much.